Good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you again this evening as we uh, continue our look at the book of Isaiah. Again, this week we're going to be in chapters uh, 7 through 12 as we kind of conclude Isaiah's extended introduction to the book. Um, here we're going to get a little bit more of a taste for uh the nature of Isaiah's prophecies, the way that God is going to deliver them, and, and as well as a, a combination of the uh, topical matters as well uh, throughout these chapters. Uh, but as we get started this evening, if you will, join with me in a word of prayer. Our High and Holy Father, we are grateful for this opportunity to gather here and to study from your word. We're thankful for your servant Isaiah and this message that you have given to us through him. And we pray, Father, that as we study these things, we will be better uh, assured of your promises, that we will be uh, better equipped, Father, to understand your prophecies and uh, to better trust in you and, and those things that you have uh, shown us through your word. Lord, we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, so... As I mentioned, Isaiah has a, and he even calls it uh, a burden to bear in that a large amount of his prophecies are somewhat negative in nature. That is, he's prophesying very much of the end of the northern kingdom. And in addition to that, he's prophesying that eventually the southern kingdom will fall as well. But interspersed through that, we have two things that that God gives throughout uh, Isaiah's prophecies that we're, and we're going to see that in here in these, these chapters as well. Um, two things that are still supposed to instill hope, even in the face of these very um, sad and, and even depressing uh, prophecies. Those two things are, are number one, the, the idea of the remnant. And we're going to see that uh, begin to emerge as a, uh, repetitious feature of, of Isaiah's writing uh, in these chapters. And then the second one are, of course, prophecies of the Messiah, prophecies of the kingdom of, of the Messiah. And uh, throughout this section, we're going to see some significant prophecies, um, but also just that's how God is going to do. He's going to go through a section where he's going to speak of destruction he's going to speak of judgment but then he's always going to come back to either or sometimes both a promise of the remnant or a promise of the messiah and we're going to see that he use, utilizes these two things in a couple of different ways um obviously the the idea of the remnant is very much more for the physical israelites and there the promise that they aren't going to be completely destroyed from the face of the earth, etc. Um, but there's also, even here in chapter 7, uh, he's going to utilize this prophecy of the Messiah as encouragement, as a, a source of hope for, uh, excuse me, for Uzziah and for, uh, uh, for Ahaz, uh, or excuse me, for Ahaz, not Uzziah, the he was the son of Isaiah, um, that God was not going to destroy the line of David. And so it's going to be an encouragement for him as well as an encouragement for the people and, of course, for us as well. Uh, and so that's what we're going to see here in these, in these next few chapters. Is, as I mentioned last week, these kind of are representative, still in an introductory way, of the larger scope of Isaiah's prophecies. And after this section, after uh, chapter 12, from chapter 13 through chapter 25, he, he's going to do this, but he's going to go much larger sections in between the hope, if you will. <laughs> uh, not because he's trying to be depressing, but just he's going to have bigger, more expanded prophecies. Um, and especially about the various nations and things, but we'll get to that, Lord willing, uh, uh, in, in the coming weeks. 
So as we look at chapter 7, uh, we have a little bit of a historical uh, interruption here. Um, and it's talking about how the, uh, the king of Aram and the king of Israel, that is the northern kingdom, attempted to besiege Jerusalem following the death of Uzziah. And Ahaz was very scared. Uh, and in verse 2 it says, It was reported to the house of David. Now, this is important because Ahaz, is the king, is, of course, of the line of David, but the emphasis here is not insignificant. Ahaz is not being ignored, but the importance that Isaiah is putting on this and the importance that Isaiah is going to put on this for the rest of the book is that it's about the house of David. Why is that significant? The lineage, of Christ. the lineage of Christ. So it's not that it's not about Ahaz, and it's not that it's not about what's happening in this moment, but God is even using this emphasis on the house of David to show that there is a bigger plan in the works. He's trying to show that this affliction, these problems, even to some extent the deportation to Assyria and Babylon are temporary and he is going to continue to fulfill his promises. Also, because Ahaz is from the house of David, the emphasis here, because he is fearful of this attack, the emphasis to him is, you're of the house of David. If you do what I told David his children needed to do, anybody remember what, that pro what the covenant was? covenant that, David, that God made with David, he made a promise regarding David's descendants. Okay, one would sit on the throne of Israel forever, but there was a condition as well. they walked in his commandments and if they did the things of the Lord, God would bless them and protect them and God would make sure that their descendants continued to reign. And so the emphasis here to Ahaz is, well, Ahaz, you're, of the descendant, you're, you're a descendant of David, okay? Are you walking in my statutes? Then don't fear. <laughs> Now, this is especially important because in verse 3 of chapter 7, Isaiah is told to take his son, Shear Jashub. Anybody remember what, what uh, Isaiah's son's name means, Shear Jashub? A remnant shall return. Isaiah is told to take his son with him to deliver this prophecy to Ahaz. I cutting out? So Isaiah is given is giving this uh, prophecy with his son in tow, emphasizing the remnant returning that God was going to preserve a remnant. And so, uh, again, the, the emphasis here for Ahaz is you should not be afraid. If you're doing what is right, you're going to be fine. That in itself is even a lesson for us. It does not matter what is going on in the world. It does not matter what threats there are to our homes, our families, any of it. If we are walking in the Lord, we have nothing to fear. Quite literally, there are two kings knocking at the door of Jerusalem, and God is telling Ahaz, it does not matter, I am with you.
God, in verse 10, God speaks to Ahaz through Isaiah, and he, and he asks Ahaz if he wants a sign. That is a sign of the surety of this prophecy. And Ahaz, to his credit, is humble enough to say, I wouldn't dare ask of a, a sign from the Lord, but God gives one anyways. And he says in verse 13, Listen now, O house of David, is it too slight of a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my uh, God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land of those two kings you dread will be forsaken. And so we have this, this prophecy of, of course, the virgin birth of, of the Messiah, but also that this is also tied to the promise uh, to Ahaz that these two kings, both the king of Israel and the king of uh, Aram, are going to fall before this time of his descendant. And so, again, he should not be afraid of this perceived threat. Now, he's going to go on in the rest of chapter 7, and he's going to talk about how Judah is going to have to go through some trials. It's going to have to go through some, uh, some difficulties. But again, remember, Isaiah's son, a remnant shall return, is in tow as an emphasis that even through all of this, God is going to be watchful over his people. Then we get to chapter 8, and here we have uh, the, the prophecy surrounding Isaiah's other son, the one with the amazing name Malachal or Hashbaz, which if you don't remember in chapter 8, verse 1, swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. And Isaiah is told to take a large tablet and write on it in plain letters, but then he's not supposed to explain it. He's just supposed to write that message on a sign. So in essence, he's writing Malar Shala Hashbaz on a sign. And that's it. And the emphasis here is that God is going to bring uh, judgment upon Samaria quickly. Uh, the king of he even names in verse seven uh, that the king of Assyria is the one that's going to do it, uh, and that he's going to sweep like a flood over uh, uh, over the northern kingdom. But then we have in verse nine and following uh, of chapter eight a reminder of the remnant. Now this is a prophecy that is is both for Judah but also for Israel. Remember, even in the nation of Israel, even in the northern kingdom, which never had a good king, even in that nation that always had a problem with idolatry, there, it was not as though every single individual in Israel was corrupted. And so this is a reminder that God is not going to simply destroy the, the righteous with the wicked. But even as this flood, as he describes it, washes over from the north, uh, even as the Assyrians uh, destroy all that is Israel, uh, God is going to save a remnant. He's going to uh, to save those uh, those who have been faithful. Then we get to chapter nine, and we have a beautiful prophecy of the Messiah. Uh, if I could have a, a volunteer read verses uh, 1 through 7, please. But there will be no more gloom for her who is in anguish. In earlier times, she treated the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, for contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the southern side of Jordan, Galilee, and of Galilee the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see great light. Those who live in dark in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation, you shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence, as of the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide spoil. 
For he shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff of their shoulders, the rod of their of their oppressor as of the battle of Gideon. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle of tumults, and a and cloak rolled in blood will, will be for burning fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end of the increase of his government or of, or of peace on the throne of David and his kingdom. To establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Thank you. All right, so this is significant in its placement and in its focus. What was the prophecy regarding the northern kingdom of Israel? That we just read in chapter 8? No more gloom? No, no, not that one. Chapter 8. Swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. What was that? What was the significance of that message? I think they understood they're going to be wiped out. Yep, they're going to be wiped out. A, a serious coming, and they're coming quick, and it's going to happen quickly. That's the emphasis, is... This was not going to be a long, drawn-out war. God was going to allow them almost overnight to be wiped off the map. But then we get to chapter 9. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. What is that a reference to? Who are Naphtali and Zebulun? They were, the, they were of the tribes, right? Where was their land? You can look at the maps in the back of your Bible. This is significant. That's why I'm asking these questions. We need to understand this prophecy. Where were Naphtali and Zebulun located? Okay. Yep, directly to the west of the Sea of Galilee. What significant city is directly to the west of the Sea of Galilee in the lands of Zebulun and Naphtali? Carpenter's son lived there. Galilee. Beth no, not Bethlehem. Nazareth. Not only Nazareth, but all of the other major cities in, in Jesus' beginning ministry are in these lands of Naphtali and Zebulun. So God has just gotten done saying he's going to allow Assyria to destroy these nations. But then he's going to bring light to these very places. See, Jesus himself is going to use this prophecy and he's going to talk about how God is going to bring light to the Gentiles, but God was not speaking solely of bringing light to foreign nations. He just got done saying the northern kingdom is walking in darkness and is going to be destroyed for it, but where's the light going to come from? Where did Jesus begin his ministry? In Nazareth. He began his ministry in Galilee, right? In the northern kingdom. That's not insignificant. That's why this prophecy is here. It's, it's, a, it's a combination prophecy, and we have to make sure that we understand that, that in its context, that it's not solely about Jesus 
also being for the Gentiles. Because at this point in time, the northern kingdom, these lands of Zaphtali and Nebulun, they are Gentiles. They are no longer the people of God. That's why he's going to allow them to be destroyed. And so God is going to then redeem this area by being, that's the place where the light begins. Yes, the church begins in Jerusalem, and, and we're going to see various prophecies about the light going out from, from Zion, and, and that's where Jesus died. And yes, that's a significant as well, but the fact that Jesus' ministry begins in Galilee, begins in what was the northern kingdom, that itself is also significant. It's God's way of showing that he really did care about those people and that he did preserve a remnant. Now we know that Jesus himself is of the tribe of Judah. His parents are originally from Bethlehem, right? Okay, but they, they lived in Nazareth. But where did a good portion of the apostles come from? Especially the two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John. Where were they from? Anybody remember? They were the first ones, so they, they were probably from there also. They were fishermen. What major body of water would they have been fishing on? The Sea of Galilee. They were from Capernaum, which is in the land of Naphtali. So even though Jesus would be a transplant there, the fact that some of the earliest apostles, the fact that some of the earliest disciples, the earliest followers helps to prove the point that God preserved a remnant. Because all the way from here in the book of Isaiah, 700 years before his death, or before his birth, I mean, all the way to the time of Christ, there are, now, there are still faithful people living in that region. People who studied the word of God and knew the signs to look for, knew these prophecies and recognized the light of God walking among them. That's amazing. That's amazing as much as the virgin birth. You know, I think it's interesting that the Jews in general understood the Messiah was coming. They were looking for it. Mm -hmm. They just didn't they misunderstood these prophecies. Um, you know, we, again, we've already seen uh, the prophecies about Jesus, about, you know, that he would be a, a bringer of peace. And here we have, uh, we have similar mentions here of booted warriors and their cloaks of blood, and they're going to be fuel for fire. He says, you're not going to need boots for battle. You're not going to need cloaks soaked with blood. He's going to be, as he says a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an eternal father, prince of peace. I love that. Again, a reference here that it would be a child born through the proper lineage and the government will rest on his shoulders. Now, what they misunderstood was that they thought it was going to be a, a civil government. They thought it was going to be a reestablishment of of Israel as they knew as they know it here at the time of the prophecy. But he came to establish a kingdom that could never be destroyed, that could never truly be attacked because it would be a kingdom without walls. Right? It's a kingdom that is not based in a centralized place. It's not a it's a kingdom that is not about zip code, location, defensible territory. And so that's how he can reign forever. And an emphasis here, I love this at the end of verse 7, 
that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This is this is a this this to me is a, a very interesting way of putting this. Excuse me. That God was so God himself was so passionate about this that he was going to make it happen no matter what. I want us to just to contemplate about that for just a moment. All right? Because yes, he's going to establish and this is tied to the throne of David. But why was the throne of David significant in the first place? Promises were given to other people before David, right? Look at Genesis chapter, I want to say 48. All kinds of promises of all this. Yes, uh, to Moses, but specifically to, to people living long before the nation of Israel ever existed. Chapter 49. I could have a volunteer read uh, Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 12. Promise of prosperity to Judah. What, what else? What other promise to Judah? Okay. What does that mean? What's a scepter? It's a significant significance of monarchy. He's saying here, all the way back in Genesis chapter 49, at the death of Jacob himself, he blesses his son Judah and says that Judah will rule his brothers. David fulfilled the promise given to Judah. And then the promises became about him. But how did Judah become even a blessed person? Who was blessed prior to Judah in the book of Genesis? Well, who is his father? Abraham. Jacob. And who was promised before Jacob? Who was his father? Isaac. And who was Isaac's father? Abraham. So in promising to fulfill the promise to David, he's promising to fulfill the promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and all of Israel. See, that's the thing is we have to go all, we go all the way back here. And that's what God is talking about when we get to the book of Isaiah. That's what he's talking about when he promises the remnant, when he promises that 
that he's going to maintain uh, this remnant when he promises that even though Israel is about to get wiped off the map, when he promises that this light is going to shine in Galilee, when he promises that the Prince of Peace is going to establish this kingdom, he's promising all the way back to the first Hebrew. That these things are going to be fulfilled, just as he said. And the zeal of God will accomplish this. He's so passionate about this. So passionate about keeping these promises. That's important. God does not merely keep his promises because he can't do wrong. He doesn't keep his promises merely just because he's righteous. He keeps his promises because he's passionate about keeping his promises. There's a difference in that, isn't there? At the end of the day, does it matter as long as you keep your promise? Not really, but isn't it more significant when you're passionate about keeping your promise? When you're passionate about keeping your word? Doesn't it make a difference to those around you and especially those to whom you've made the promise? Okay? You make a promise. I promise X, Y, or Z, and then, well, some pretty major hindrances come along, right? Things that make it seem as though there's absolutely no way you're going to keep promise X, Y, or Z. But you're passionate about making sure X, Y, and Z happen, no matter what. That's a big deal. Yeah, and we and we need to understand this for ourselves as well as well because God was not simply passionate about bringing Jesus into the world. He was passionate about what bringing Jesus into the world did. Right? So then after this, God is going to get back to well, it's kind of a negative promise. Chap beginning in verse 8, he's going to talk about how Israel is going to fall because they refused to know and follow the law. That even though God struck them, and even though God tried to show them and sent them prophets, and, and they just refused to listen. And so then in chapter 10, God talks about uh, the, uh, the impending doom, and he even names Assyria in verse 5. He says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, the, and the staff in whose hands is my indignation. God is saying, look, I'm going to use Assyria, but they're not going to like what's going to happen to them after I'm done with them. Isn't that interesting? He says, woe to Assyria, who is my tool for destruction. He says in verse 12, so that it will be when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the pomp of his haughtiness. So God here is, is again re reminding Israel that even though he's going to use these wicked nations, even though here specifically he's talking about Assyria later in this same book, and of course we understand in continuing prophecies he's going to use Babylon to the same extent, but he says, but they're, they're going to be punished and they're going to be punished even worse than you are. You see, Assyria has no promise of a remnant. Assyria has no promise of a continuation of bloodline. Assyria will be destroyed and she'll cease to exist. 
as will Babylon. Then at the close of chapter 10, we have another promise of the remnant. Verse chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 20. Now in that day, the remnant of Israel and all those of the house of Jacob who escaped will never again rely on the one who struck them, but will rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. He's saying, I'm going to use this to show how wrong it is for you to tie yourselves to the nations. Remember, at the point of time that Isaiah is working, Israel actively is working with other nations, right? We just saw that in chapter 7, the northern king of Israel is, is tying himself to the kingdom of Aram to try and attack Jerusalem. God says, I'm going to teach you just how wrong that is. By using one of your former allies. You think Assyria is going to save you? They're going to destroy you. Then I'm going to destroy them, and you'll see that I am the only one that you can rely on. And then that remnant will return. The remnant of Jacob, the mighty God. Only a remnant will, will, within them will return. He's not promising that the majority, he's not promising to return Israel in its former glory, but he is promising that they will not be forgotten completely. Then we have chapter 11. Can I have a volunteer read verses 1 through 5, please? A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From the roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Thank you. Who is Jesse? I heard a couple things. Father of Christ? Specifically, David's father. So in that way, yes, the father of Christ. But the emphasis here is, again, of the Davidic line. The root of Jesse. And we have this branch. And this is, this is again, a prophecy of the Messiah and a prophecy of the restoration of Israel. And it will be a king whose, whose reign is more splendid than anything they've ever thought of. Whose reign will be more splendid even than Solomon. Right? Because Solomon was the wisest man ever to walk and, and, you know, wondrous in his wisdom. And yet, how could Solomon judge? How did Solomon make his decisions? With the help of God, but only based on the evidence that he could see, right? Only based on the testimonies which he could hear, but look at verse 3. Christ will come and he will look past that, right? He'll look to the soul, to the heart. Divining the minds of people. And that's what it means in verse 4 when it talks about deciding with fairness the afflicted of the earth, striking the earth with the rod of his mouth and the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Jesus is not, did not come to begin physical battles, right? But does that mean that Jesus came to appease everyone? No. No. 
And again, there's a prophecy of, of peace. Verses 6 through 9, this is where we see the, uh, the wolf dwelling with the lamb and the, the calf and the, and the lion laying down together. Um, all of those prophecies there. And then in verse 10, Then in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. Again, the beauty of this and, and the, the re reminder um, that this is all going to come about because God wants it to. Then in the latter part of verse, uh, chapter 11, the last part here, is again about the remnant. He will re again recover the second time with his hand, the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathras, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. He will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel, gathered the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And it's a promise here. You'll see here he often uses the, phrase, the, the name Ephraim as a reference to Israel. This was common. Uh, Ephraim at that time was most likely the largest of the tribes in the same way that Judah is used exclusively of the southern kingdom, even though there were actually two, king, two tribes encompassed within Judah. And so this, this promise is not only of the remnant, is not only for Judah, it's not only for the more, I want to say, uh, I don't want to give them the credit that they're due. They were slightly more faithful to God, but not by a whole lot, and only at times. But it's not as though God is only going to restore from Judah. He's going to restore all the tribes, at least in small part. But more than that, he says that they're going to go out and they're going to, they're going to be bigger than they were. And this is, this is likely more a prophecy of, uh, of the Messianic age than it is a physical Israel because there's not a time after the captivities where Israel itself actually asserts itself in a political sense over these regions, but it's probably more talking about the fact that through Christ, through the new kingdom, the spiritual Israel, all of these places will be subjugated, right? And so then chapter 12, all six verses are a, a song, a prayer of thanks. Thanks that though God is angry and though he will bring his wrath upon them, that he's going to save them. And that he is going, he does continue to do good things and will do good things. So that's our, that concludes the introduction to Isaiah as written by Isaiah himself. So this is kind of what we can expect for the rest of the book. It's, it's going to be kind of these cyclical things. Um, as I said, there's this extended section here from chapter 13 through chapter 25, where it is very much, not exclusively, but it's very, very much about the destruction of the nations and God judging all of these peoples and all of these nations that either have are or will be a threat to God's people. Because the very first one in chapter 13, by the way, is Babylon, who at this point in time is not actually a threat to Israel. And yet they're the first ones mentioned. <laughs> Interesting how God does that, isn't it? But it's a promise that God is going to judge these nations. So he's, he's using these nations to judge his own people, even as he did in the time of Judges, in the time of the Judges, right? God would allow Israel to be overrun. He would rise, raise up a judge to fight back the threat. The people would return, and that would continue. God is essentially saying here through Isaiah and other prophets like Isaiah, he's trying to break that cycle. He says, 
you need to learn this once for all. Not to depend on nations, not to depend on their false gods, but to depend on me. And so God is going to emphasize that by talking about destroying all of these nations. Then he's also going to talk, like I said, uh, repeatedly throughout these chapters about the remnant of Israel. And of course, we're going to have, because it's Isaiah, it's the book of the Messiah, if you will. There's going to be a lot about the Messianic kingdom to come as well. But there are going to be stretches where there's not a whole lot about the Messiah until we get to the last half of the book. But like I said, we're not going to be going chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Um, through a lot of this, especially the passages on, on the judgments, we're just going to kind of hit high points and things because not a huge a lot of application. Plus, I want to focus on what these mean. We're going to focus on some phrasing that is used um, because God is going to repeat some of these phrasings in other um, prophetic books, Ezekiel and Revelation specifically, because that's where we're headed with our studies. Um, and so we're, we need to recognize these things and we need to recognize these phrasings um, that God is going to be using when he talks about these times of judgment. And as he's talking about these nations being destroyed, um, it's also going to become significant that, well, if he's talking about Babylon being destroyed, he's not talking about the end of the world, right? And so if he uses that same phrase again, it's possible, if not probable, that he's also not talking about the end of the world, and that's very significant. And so that's how we're going to utilize some of these sections where it's not necessarily readily apparent how it's applicable to us, is it's, it's our decoder ring, if you will, so that we can better understand prophecy in general, but especially significant to us is being able to understand the book of Revelation, because we do need to understand the book of Revelation. It's part of the New Testament, right? Um, the only books that we have about that would be books like um, Ezekiel and Daniel, where it talks about people who were living in those times. Um, of course, Daniel is representing kind of more of the, you know, the nobles, the the um, the the wealthy, the the ruling class. But Ezekiel worked amongst the people, and um, we do know that some some people were left behind. Um, not a lot, but specifically we understand that the race of, some, of the Samaritans came about because of people who were left behind following Assyrian and Babylonian captivities, and they intermarried and became half Jewish, half Gentile, essentially. And that's why we see, for example, in Jesus' lifetime, the Samaritan woman and others, and they talk about very biblical things. And they understand the Messiah even, but they're way off on a lot of their other thoughts and especially in their worship and things of that nature. But um, the rest would have been, and, and a lot of what God's talking about specifically to this is the remnant that gets scattered, even as we just saw, right, where he talked about, I'm going to bring my peoples from the four corners. They were just carried away in the captivity and they lived their lives as best they could. Um, books, even, even books like Ezekiel, Ezra, Nehemiah, um, by the way, they also mentioned that some people had such prosperous lives and established themselves that they actually didn't even return to Israel. Um, and this is what's often referred to as the, uh, uh, the diaspora or the dispersion of the Jewish peoples. Um, is that, And it's part of what, by the way, led to the gospel being able to spread because where did Paul go on his missionary journeys most of the time? when he first got to a city, to synagogues. Those synagogues wouldn't have existed if the Jewish people hadn't been pushed into these faraway places and stayed there. 
food for thought, that when Paul comes into cities like Corinth and when he comes into cities like Athens and when he comes into places like Philippi and other places and he finds Jewish people gathering, because Jewish people live there. Sometimes you have to lead with a cattle prod. So, all right, I'll turn it over for the devotional. Thank you. Good evening. Let's turn uh, in our songbooks to number 743. 743. <clears throat> 743. O land of rest for thee, I sigh, when will the moment come when I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. And we'll be gathered home No tranquil joys on earth I know No peaceful sheltering dome This world's a wilderness of woe This world is not my home We'll gathered home to Jesus Christ I fled for rest he bade me cease to roam and lean for succor on his breast till he conduct me home we'll will work till Jesus comes will work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home I sought at once my Savior sight no more my steps shall roam with him Death's chilling tide and reach my heavenly home. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Mark in your books, number 50, five zero, will be our song of opportunity after our lesson. Five zero. Good evening, everyone. Tonight I'm going to talk about what everyone this time of year is focused upon. 
hustle and bustle of people running around, trying to get around, getting everything accomplished before that big day draws closer and time slips away. The Christmas season seems to creep up on us faster and faster each year. <clears throat> Unfortunately, many people seem to slip in and only spread one thing this time of year. Someone we should remember much more. <clears throat> I was looking for something that would start off my topic and I found this poem and it goes like this. Just one week before Christmas, once prayers had been heard, the people were scurrying to get out God's word. The hymns were being sung to holy God above in thanks of him sending Jesus Christ in his love. Christmas brings remembrance of family and friends and the importance of sharing a love without end. Our blessings are too numerous, our hearts filled with joy, yet our eyes have often drifted away from our Lord. The Christmas season brings forth the best in most souls to help those less fortunate and lighten their load. <clears throat> Salvation was offered for all to receive if only one person would listen, heed, and believe. So if you don't know him down deep in your heart, ask him to save you now. You'll be changed on the spot. I have some questions for you tonight. <clears throat> what do you think many people believe Christmas is? You think it's about gift giving? Getting together with family and friends that you only see possibly once a year? Remembering the birth of Christ? A day off work? To eat a big meal and relax? Remember the blessings you've been given for the year? I tend to believe that probably that it's probably all these above. Kind of go all along with these questions. But I want to focus on this poem in the birth of Christ. <clears throat> Even though we don't have a definite date as of the correct day Christ was born, do you believe it's a good time good to only remember Christ once a year? Or as the poem says, one week before Christmas, scurrying around to get out God's word. <clears throat> or a few months after Christmas when the date falls on Easter and remember his resurrection. I don't believe it's bad to remember Christ on those days, but we do have instruction from Scripture to remember him more. I know those of you here tonight will know the answer to these questions, but there might be someone listening that might need some clarification regarding this. We have many examples through Scripture, <clears throat> but I'm only, going to go to, I'm only going to focus on a few tonight. We have examples in Acts when the first church was established after the apostles received the gifts of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47, it says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. <clears throat> Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and sharing them all them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved." In Acts 27, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began teaching to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17, it says, Do you not know <clears throat> that you are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and what is and that is what you are. Ephesians five, one through two. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. In first John two three through six it says, By this we know that we have Common that we have come to know him, 
If we keep his commandments, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought to ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. First John three twenty two through twenty four, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and we do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his Son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. We know by this act that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. And the last one, John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. I believe the scriptures that I just read give us a good indication as to how we are to remember Christ. There are so many other scriptures that we can help help us focus and remember him. <clears throat> we need to remember we need to remember him day by day and each first day of the week as stated in the first new, in the first New Testament church in Acts. The only way we become a temple of God and his spirit dwell within us to be holy be imitators of him is to remember him daily. Continue in love and keep his commandments so we can abide, so he can abide in us and we can walk in the same manner as Lord as our Lord Jesus Christ. It is good for us to remember Christ the days this world has selected, but we can't achieve the promises mentioned here in these few scriptures if we only remember him twice a year. We can't lead others to Christ as we have been studying all this year, if we only remember Jesus' birth only on Christmas. It's a daily ritual. His birth, crucifixion, burial, and resurrection should be remembered each and every day of our lives and in our minds continually. For us to be pleasing in His sight, we need to walk day by day with Him. Following in His path, and the footprints laid out for us throughout the scriptures. By doing this, we won't walk in darkness, and Jesus will dwell within us, and he will give us the light of the life. At the end of every service, we offer the opportunity, if anyone here needs prayers of the congregation, or anyone listening online would like more information regarding the precious gift that Jesus offers to us, please come forward now or contact us as we stand and we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? In the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. 
Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. Good evening, everyone. Um, there's just a couple of announcements. The winter camp is going to be December the 27th at YBC. Um, of course, we have our Bible study at 9.30, our worship at 10.30, and our evening worship at 5. And you know, if you have the chance, just you need to come to the, these classes. There's, there's so much information that, that here has been preparing and delivering to us. And we need to support and, and be here. Um, is there anything else that needs to be announced? Let's pray. Almighty Father God in heaven, we are so grateful that you've set aside this time for us to gather together in your name to, to hear your word, to learn portions of your word and take it into our daily lives. But we're so grateful for those who prepare the lessons and and bring them to us. And we ask that you bless them each and every day of their lives, Lord. Lord, we are so grateful that you're our Father and you watch over us and you lead us in the path that, that we need to go down. Lord, we know that a lot of times we get off that path and, and we are so grateful that you're there for us when we turn back to you. Lord, help us today to see the things you would have us do and to help us accomplish those things. Lord, help us to better our Christian walk each and every day of our life and, and doing that by learning more about how you would have us act. Lord, guide us, keep us safe, and be with those who are ill and unable to be here when we gather together in your name to draw strength from one another. Lord, guide us, keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.